Hi, and welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm Dawn Davis, and this is episode number 53. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, thank you so much for coming back. And a special shout-out to you, Kelly Castillo, for your generous donation to the podcast and for your kind words. Thank you. If you're looking for more information about the podcast, past guests, or want to catch up on previous episodes, or just want to drop me a line, it's all at the website, DesertLadyDiaries.com. And I invite you to follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Desert Lady Diaries and on Twitter at Desert Lady Diary. In this episode, I'm talking with artist Linda Sibio. She spent a lot of her life managing mental illness and teaching others how to accept and manage theirs through art and performance. We'll also talk about her Economics of Suffering exhibit, which will be at New York City's Andrew Edlund Gallery in early 2019. At the end of the interview, I'll give you some information about an upcoming fundraiser in Los Angeles for the exhibition. Welcome back to Desert Lady Diaries. I'm here today with Linda Carmela Sibio. Growing up in West Virginia and orphaned at an early age, Linda Carmela Sibio started drawing at age 11. Since 1985, Linda has worked in various art media and performance art. She assisted in starting the Los Angeles Poverty Department, a performance troupe in Los Angeles' Skid Row, and has an interest in those living on the fringes of society, particularly those with mental illness, and how those experiences affect culture as a whole. Linda takes symptoms of insanity and transpose them into techniques for making experimental art, one of those being through her philosophy, The Insanity Principle, which is a workshop Linda teaches in the high desert. Her work has been seen at the United Nations, Brussels Contemporary Art Fair, VSA Arts at the Kennedy Center, Red Cat in Los Angeles. Linda is represented by Andrew Edlund Gallery in New York. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so as I usually start the podcast is, what was your very first experience with the desert? My first experience the first few days I got out here I moved all my stuff into this little cabin I still live in and everything was in boxes and I was having a nervous breakdown so I would go out every three days and lay in the ground on the sand and call the ambulance before I got there to make sure that I wouldn't die of not being able to breathe <laughs> that's a panic attack yeah and at the same time i started a series called the insanity principle paintings which really changed my career a lot because up till then i was doing uh, multidisciplinary installations and performance and stuff and i just started painting again just painting you know and I did that for seven years, and I didn't go out or do anything, mm -hmm. just did the painting. How did you discover this place? Well, my ex-boyfriend, Richie Miller, <laughs> he moved out here from our house in Echo Park in oh. Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. We lived in Echo Park before it was popular. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he moved out here, and I got evicted shortly thereafter from my place in LA and I had dogs. And also I was in the Glendale Memorial Hospital, the psychiatric ward, mm -hmm. for a month. And they started making moves like they wanted to put me in a board and care. So I snuck out of there. My car was in the parking lot. All my stuff was already packed up. So I just drove out here. I wow. followed, followed Richie out here and I saw him in the coffee shop and he goes, I'm not going to help you. Oh, <laughs> I said, I said, fine. I said, I'm, I'm going to live out here. Mm -hmm. So, I don't. If you don't want to help me, that's fine. You know. Right. When was that? How long ago was that? That was in 1997. Wow. Okay. And he finally did help me. And Ruth had this little house, which had a big room, this pretty big room. Yeah. That I could use as a studio, and also has a shed that I could put some of my stuff in and. So it, it worked out perfectly, but the place didn't have any water, no heat. Well, the heat was kerosene, which oh almost, almost burned the place down several times. The fire department got to know me pretty well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just really rustic, but Ruth... She's a meditation teacher. At, she started Don Medina Retreat Center. Mm -hmm. She took care of me. She brought me food three times a day. She signed up to get the water, the city water. Mm. And she helped me put a fence around the house for my dogs. And she only charged me $175 a month rent. Wow. 
And then she offered to let me buy the place for $10,000. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to do it. I didn't figure I was going to stay out here. But she says, look, darling, it'll keep you from being homeless. <laughs> 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 and she was right. Yeah. You know? So well, That's great. Yeah. What a great story. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> So you discovered your mental illness fairly early on. Yeah. Was, and that's a lot of what your work captures. Mental yeah. Illness. I first did my piece, a piece on mental illness, which was about my mother, because she was severely schizophrenic. and Which is how you had, got to the orphanage. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. And I did a piece called the West Virginia Schizophrenic Blues. One reason I wanted to do that piece was in homage to my mother, because we were so young when she died she committed suicide my, oh, si- my okay. sister differs her <laughs> in okay her opinion right. of that but anyway she died suddenly and i never got her a tombstone because i left west virginia and never went back because it was so horrible there. Mm-hmm. and so that was the performance was my tombstone for my mother mm. kind of and i played it from her point of view you know yeah and uh, um we have a lot of this in the news today about mental illness right? and it not really being addressed or still to this day being um, stigmatizing. Oh, Why do you think that is? Do you have any opinions on that? Well, people want to think of mentally ill people as mentally ill, not just insane. Mm. <laughs> Those are two different implications. Insanity has a history. You know, Foucault's book, Mm. and I read a book called Anti-Oedipus, which is philosophically about schizophrenia and how it affects society. Mm -hmm. And Artaud was a big person in my life, Anthony Artaud. And all these have history. Mental illness does not have a history. It's just like, you're sick, let's put you away. Mm. And and let's put you in jail. Now now the thing is jail. Right, because there are no, I guess... There were asylums, but there were also, like, the state hospitals at one time. Right. And my, that's of, what my mother was in. Okay. And a lot of people <laughs> seem to think that this all started with Reagan, when, in fact, I've re- just recently read a book by one of the younger Kennedys who talks about the number of times mental illness has come up in Congress, things to be voted on, legislation, policy on how to manage it, and something seems to always come in and either take it off track or it doesn't seem as important as some other issue that's happening at yeah, the moment. Yeah, it's always the thing last is, thing. Right. And the thing is, right now in this community, if you get sick, you come down with a mental illness, there are no counselors that will see you. They're mm-hmm. all filled up. Right. That's The county did, has not provided this community with enough counselors to meet the needs of the community right and i just i just helped a young lady i've helped her now for a year and a half and i was trying to keep her from going to jail for something she did not do Mm. but that a police officer accused her of and i won't say specifics but she has been incarcerated either in jail or Patton state hospital for over a year and a half and has never ever been to trial and this is something that the governments are doing to get people in jail. They do that to mentally ill people, poor people, and people of color, different uh, ethnic groups. Mm-hmm. And it's a big scam, and it's very bad in California. I was just astonished at this whole thing. Right, and it doesn't seem, too, that if you start coupling that with potentially a drug addiction, mm-hmm. because someone who's mentally ill may not be on program, if you will, to take their meds when they need them or something happens and maybe they lose insurance and they can't get their meds and now they're going to self-medicate. And I'm sure you saw a lot of that down in Skid Row. Oh, yeah, with alcohol and drugs. Right, exactly. Yeah. So tell me about the cracked eggs and how that all got started. Oh, the cracked eggs. I I had a group of my own, after doing the Los Angeles Poverty Department, I had a group of my own called Operation Hammer, which were all mentally ill people from Skid Row. I worked out out of a place called Lamp, The oh, Lodge, yeah. Molly. and Molly. Yeah. Yeah, and I did the program there for two years, and then she laid me off, and I continued to do it until 1996. We did maybe 
20 to 30 sto uh, shows in the Skid Row area and the Los Angeles area mm -hmm. at large. Highway's performance space uh, let us present at least two pieces there. Mm -hmm. And I, got, I always tell this story about my lead actor. He did two things that were just really funny, which says it all. Uh, we were shot, we had got our costumes from Mark Taper Form, mm. their costume shop, mm -hmm. and they let us just go in there and pick what we want. Wow. And he was talking to a mannequin. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the lady was saying, I said, yeah, he's just talking to the mannequin. It's okay. Mm. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then another time when we were at Highways, a performance artist came up. I forget who it was, but Robert just laid down on the ground in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> so it then, makes for some like quick reaction kind of stuff, like, what are you going to do now? <laughs> people are so afraid of the mentally ill, but the mentally ill are so funny. And they go, they're so out there that I think they're art pieces. All of them are art pieces mm -hmm. in themselves once they learn to accept themselves. You know? Right. And, and that's, that's what the Cracked Eggs is about, is making serious art with mentally disabled people in interdisciplinary, very contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And because the performance deals with the emotions, the writing deals with the intelligence, and the visual deals with all sorts of things like mm -hmm. costume sets, paintings, drawings, mm -hmm. and stuff, and all different, all the different parts of their minds and bodies are being used. Mm -hmm. And I think the the problem with therapy is usually it's talk therapy, and I know because of my own schizophrenia that I do not get too much from the therapy of talk therapy. Mm. I have to have something physical, you know, right. to yell and scream and get my emotions out and, and, and then I can be calm and talk to someone. Mm -hmm. But without that, that thing of getting your emotions out and dealing with the emotions, it's just like gibberish when psychologists talk. And I'm sure other people feel a similar way. Right. So I see this as a, the way it fits in in mental health is a bridge between the psychologist and the psychiatrist that before they go in to see a psychologist, they take the class a few times and get unbottled up, mm. you know, and then they'll know how more how to talk to the psychologist. Right. Almost like removing any blockages or exactly. inhibitions or anything like yeah. that and accepting what's happening and then trying to get through a way to figure out how to manage it. And I recently had a, a meeting with the county, the head of programming, mm -hmm. and she loved what she saw on tapes and stuff because mm -hmm. my husband has made tapes of a lot of the last things we did okay and her and her friend just loved it so i don't know what they're going to do but right. i hope that they fund it mm -hmm. you know so it can be happening well that would again. be great because like you said people can't even get in to see the counselor right and this but this at least would in be this something group i can i can take up to 15 people at a time right so how did you develop this insanity principle? Talk to me about how that came to the surface. Well, when I was working on Skid Row, I was mostly working with people who are unmedicated. Mm -hmm. And I was also, in LA, I was very unstable, was hallucinating a lot, hearing things, hearing voices, the whole bit. I was very confused. And when I started working on Skid Row, it became an anchor for my own confusion. Mm -hmm. And through finding out techniques where I could get people to focus and get to know their own mind a little bit, I also healed myself, mm. you know. But the techniques were developed from the structures of the diagnosis that they had. And if they weren't diagnosis, I could tell pretty much what was going right. on. Right. <laughs> so can you give me an example using yeah. one of the diagnoses? Um, yeah, like there was this one guy who had a split personality disorder, or now it's called something else, but then it was called that. And he believed, I think he was also bipolar too, he believed he was Jesus, oh, wow. Christ. And I gave him this exercise where, okay, Michael, you stand here in the center, and when you're over here, you're going to be Jesus, and when over here, you're going to be Michael, the objective observer, right? So after doing the exercise, he, 
he was like, he was less confused about his relationship between being Jesus and being Michael. Mm. He had integrated it somewhat into his psyche. Mm. So he didn't have to be so demonstrative about being Jesus anymore, you know? How interesting. Yeah. And then there was another guy who had an obsession about outer space. That's a common delusion. But uh, maybe it's not a delusion, but, you know, mm, right. it's a common thought. So he, he would always go and tell people he's going to a spaceship and stuff. And mm-hmm. So I said, Joseph, you're convince us about your ideas about having a spaceship and having been on another planet. Mm-hmm. Convince us. Tell us a story right. that convinces us. Yeah. You know? So he told this story, and as he was telling a story, he was losing energy. <laughs> oh. And as he, I could see him changing his mind. So by the end of the exercise, he says, well, maybe I don't really have a spaceship. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's that kind of thing you put, wow. you use techniques that are similar to the symptoms, and that resets their mind somehow. I don't know how because I haven't had a researcher work with me, which mm. I'm interested in doing. Sure. But the mind resets and also they begin to understand themselves instead of saying, that delusion is bad. Take this medication. I'm not totally against meds and mm. small doses sure. and, and not too many kinds, but I think that if they were working together, the meds and this kind of work, the whole person would be healthier. Right. We're so quick to just kind of slap a pill on everything instead right. of really getting down to the root cause, if you will, of what where the issue is and then learning how to manage based on what we discover. Yeah, and I've experienced it in, in the Glendale Psychiatric Unit. No matter if I said one little thing about being upset or angry, they would put me on another pill. When I left there, I was on 43 different pills. Oh, my gosh. You know, That's and then out of hand. I quickly went back to my psychologist at Hollywood Mental Health, and she put me on Zyprexa, which was much better, but it, it has a lot of side effects. And then Abilify came out, and I take Abilify, which I'm not normal, but... Is anybody normal? I'm functional. <laughs> I'm very functional. Right, yeah. You know, I can do a lot of things. Yeah. So I think there is the right combination of therapy and, and meds. Right. But the right work. kind of therapy. Right, yeah. but, you know, it's all very individual, mm-hmm. you know. Tell me about the monstrous psychologist at oh, the yeah. swap meet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wearing the sunglasses. Right. What I did is I... By played... the way, if what you missed when I got here, because I'm interviewing Linda at her place, uh, she was wearing uh, sunglasses that are... The frames have pearls around them, <laughs> which was super cool. And so I did a kind of... It was a fun... Not It was a not a funny piece, but it was done with fun in it. Mm-hmm. And I played a psychologist called uh, Nancy Neutral. And my goal was to teach people how to balance their emotions, angry, happy, sad, and frightened. Mm. So I had a, a sheet of questions that I would ask people, like, what do you do when you get up in the morning? How do you feel when you get up in the morning? And trying to get them to admit they had any feelings at all. And <laughs> some people didn't admit it. Wow. You know, when they didn't admit it, I said, well, you're totally stuffed up. You're not dealing with your feelings at all. I said, your feelings should all be in balance in your body. Like if someone's bipolar, they need to balance their anger and their delight, you know? Mm. Uh, They need to balance it so that the sad and the frightened come in and they're all working together. But they're so hung up on the two, you know, that's right extremes. Extremes that... They don't pay attention to the others. I honestly believe that if they express the others, I work a lot in opposites. And so when I was trying to get people to admit their emotions, I worked in opposites. Well, let's work on angry and happy to try to get them. It triggers your mind so you could go deeper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I serve people lemonade in Mm -hmm. case I do it again. Homemade lemonade. (laughs) Well, sort of homemade. Right. (laughs) And then it was real hot, so I had um, water with ice in it, Mm -hmm. and I put uh, like a clean towel in there, and I let them 
put it on their face mm-hmm. so they'd be very cool mm-hmm. and then the one of the coolest parts of it was uh, Kip loaned me a chair which is a rocking chair mm-hmm. and it comes from the 60s oh, wow. and it was green and they could rock back and forth <laughs> which is very therapeutic and I uh, love a rocking chair They're and wonderful. stuff and people really relaxed and had fun and they revealed some interesting things about mm. themselves, and they all thought that my hypothesis was correct. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to be doing that anytime? Maybe uh, in the fall. Okay. I don't know. High Desert Test Sites sponsors it. Okay. So it depends, you right, know. Right, exactly. And they also sponsor, are they sponsoring your Insanity Principle workshops as well? Yeah, I think that's going to start up again in the fall. Okay, the great. The Insanity Principle. Right. And so, how many, you said about up to 15 people you take in that class? Yes. Okay. And people should check the High Desert Test Sites website. Okay. It, it would be on there if I was doing it. Right. Okay. And that's going to continue here at the Copper Mountain Mesa Community Center? Yes. Okay. And if I think if I read right, it's a suggested $30 donation. Yes. Because it's a, a full day, right? Several hours. It's four hours. Four hours. Okay. Yeah. So like half a day. Yeah. Okay. And uh, also, there are scholarships for those in need. Mm-hmm. that can't afford it and I do work exchange sometimes too okay so. well I just did some work with you and it was really fun we worked in front of a green screen and you said now you have the footage is ready to go mm-hmm. and that show tell me about what the show encompasses that's going to be in New York City and it's through your gallery right yes yeah well I've done 14 13 inch by 20 inch paintings and in gouache on and I use color in accents of gold and silver when necessary maybe it's just all color but they're very colorful and they're about the theme of economics and how people suffer as a result of being poverty stricken or lower class or middle class Mm -hmm. especially in this day and age where services are being taken away I think the government and the corporations should realize that when they take away services from poor people, that there's humanity behind it, and those people are suffering. Yeah. You know, that's what it's all about, is suffering as a result of things that could be made okay mm-hmm. if, if things were handled properly. Right. You know, so it's unnecessary suffering. Yeah. There'll be like about 20 paintings. Mm -hmm. There'll be an installation of the graph of the 2007 recession when it began, Mm -hmm. like the moment it began. Mm -hmm. And that will have on it about a hundred small five inch by five inch drawings on economics. There'll be the film. I'm not sure exactly how I'm using the film, but the film and the performance will work together Mm -hmm. in some way. I just got the idea of putting a web over the whole room with yellow rope Mm. as an installation. Because I had originally wanted to use a big sewer pipe that's seven feet tall. Oh, wow. And it's yellow and black. And the thing is, I couldn't afford it. It cost quite a bit of money. Mm. So I think this yellow web would be a symbolic thing. Like yeah. people get tangled up in these economic issues. And it's and, hard to get out. And can't function. And mm. So I'm thinking of doing that too right. with it. I'm that still working cool. on the performance and, the, and that part. So it is very multidisciplinary. Yes. It's across, you know, you have paintings, you have the video, you have the wall. Right. And all that stuff. So, And that is happening, you just found out, in January? January at the Andrew Edlin Gallery, sometime between January 17th and March 17th. Excellent. 2019. That's fun. So watch Andrew Edlin's website. Right. I'll put for... that in. There's a, there'll be a blog okay. post. I'll put the link in there to it. Okay. And we'll have that. Yeah. Now, you've been out here in the desert, what, 20, 20 years. years? How's it been? Well, I I was thinking about that the other day, and I, seven years I was having a nervous breakdown. Then I came down with a physical illness oh, for another six or seven years. So I've only had six years of health. Mm. But I'm thinking, wow, even while I was sick, I did work. Mm. You know, I worked on my art. 
do you think that the place itself allows for that? It, you know, where it, you it, are? I'm paranoid, so it, it allows me to work on my art without feeling other people are looking down my nose trying to see what I'm thinking so that they can do it too. Mm. <laughs> Which is what I got in big cities. Yeah. You know, right. I saw a lot of my ideas after I would do them, they would spring up and there'd be a flurry of people doing the similar work and I just can't deal with it. Mm. You know, I really yeah. can't. So the isolation of being out here with Yeah, less. out here you don't have to worry about that because people are so isolated from each other that they're into their own thing. Mm-hmm. You know, they, right. they're doing what they do and, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Have you had any experiences that were um, a little off-putting or frightening or creatures that out you here? Know, come out? Yeah. Well, yeah. Actually, the area I live in, Copper Mountain Mesa, used to be the worst area for violence really in this whole area and a criminals lived up here people hiding from the law all sorts of things went up and i remember one night i was driving home from the retreat center in domadina and it was late and i couldn't figure out where my house was right no street lights <laughs> right dirt roads <laughs> and these people started following me oh goodness very slowly mm. right behind me and i didn't want to go down my street because i figured they would know where i live right so i drove back to domadine <laughs> <laughs> and i said i can't find my house and these people are following me did they follow you to domadina yeah did they and, and then there's another really funny story. This is really funny. I was studying a Vipassana meditation with Ruth Dennison, and there's this lady named Jane Hein. She doesn't matter if I use her name, but <laughs> she gave me herbs for my hallucinations. Mm. And then everyone went to the spa and left me there by myself. <laughs> and I started, I, I didn't want to go to the spa. Uh-huh. And I started hallucinating. Oh, no. And I was horrified. I couldn't stop hallucinating. I was scared. I was paranoid. So I called the lady who runs the place, Ruth Dennison, and I said, Ruth, I need to go to the hospital, you know? <laughs> and she goes, darling, just come over here and I'll take care of you. Aww. So I went over there and she just did all this stuff about touching mm. the body mm-hmm. and saying positive reinforcement type mm-hmm. things and stuff. Right. And after about five hours I I was out of it oh wow yeah <laughs> so, I thought that was pretty special yeah for sure so do you go up there often and meditate have well, you taken uh, their 10 day well Ruth has passed away right and they just got a new resident teacher mm. arena okay and I think she seems pretty good mm-hmm. she's originally from Australia I think and she's a very good teacher I I'm waiting I'm cautious mm-hmm. you know about what will happen and yeah. things but sure. I think it's a good place they have meditation every Thursday night at mm-hmm. 7 or 7 30 uh, I think they for do the, the community too, right yeah, yeah for the community can, okay. everyone can go there for free and meditate that's great which I think is a good service yeah that's wonderful yes yeah. being that the mental health things are so bad exactly oh, that's but great. I, i'm trying I'm, i bought a bicycle i'm without a car and i'm trying to learn how to ride my bike over there mm, okay. for the meditation and yeah. then i can ride back yeah yeah that's a good ride <laughs> yeah it's like two miles think, yeah right right yeah yeah, yeah. So you'll be getting some exercise too yeah <laughs> that's good that is good I would like to mention that uh, my friendship with Andrea Zettel has done a lot to improve my professional life. Yeah. I'm very, very thankful to her for... Yeah, I'm hoping to get that. her on the podcast eventually, and Vanessa. I see Vanessa often at the pancake breakfast at the oh. um, community center. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, well, you know, nice. she's introduced me to a whole new community of artists out here, and I like them, and they like me, and... So I that's think, wonderful. Uh, I'm happier. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. So, well, thank you so much okay. for taking the time to be on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. 
The fundraiser for Linda's Berserk Productions is 2 to 4 p.m. on Sunday, September 16th. It's at a private residence in L.A. and is limited to 30 people. If you'd like more information, email Linda at berserkpro, B-E-Z-E-R-K-P-R-O, at gmail.com. And that information will also be on the blog page with Linda's photo and a photo of one of her art pieces. Thanks so much for listening to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast. I want you to know how much I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you heard something that inspired or enlightened you, I'd love to hear about it. Send an email to desertladydiaries at gmail.com or start a discussion with other listeners at the Desert Lady Diaries Facebook page. Next week, award-winning poet Lauren Henley will be talking about her poetry, growing up in Joshua Tree, and her battles with multiple autoimmune diseases. I know that's what you were expecting this week, but I had a little mix-up with my production calendar. And if you're enjoying this podcast, I hope you'll subscribe. It's free to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify, and most other podcast services. And if you're not familiar with downloading podcasts, you can always listen for free on SoundCloud, YouTube, or just go to DesertLadyDiaries.com and listen from the podcast page. Thanks so much for listening.